Um, I've, I've heard uh, the evolutionists, you know, atheistic evolutionists, argue uh, with some difficulty, struggle to explain the phenomenon of human compassion. If, if everything is a matter of you know, the selfish gene, and if everything is a matter of uh, survival of the fittest and whatnot, how do you explain compassion? And they struggle to explain it convincingly. I've heard them struggle to do that. Uh, and I've seen what happens to sometimes tough, hardened hearts that are then converted to Christ. And I've seen compassion grow. I've, I've had old ladies in perhaps my first church and then my second church. Old ladies who've been, you know, they've been tough old girls. They've moved out of the East End or something into, you know, somewhere out of town. And uh, quite tough old girls, you know, tough old birds. And then you come to the chapel and you watch yourself, you know, because uh, they're tough old girls. But, but then Christ is formed in them. And on so many occasions, I've had perhaps an elderly lady, as I've been visiting and drinking tea, the way you have to, and doing all that lovely stuff, say, I'm having terrible trouble watching the news these days. I find it all so hard. It's all so sad. And you've seen a heart of compassion being formed in that person. I've seen it with tough young guys too. As a heart of compassion is formed, and they find suffering such a hard thing to deal with anymore. The compassion of Christ is, is built into people as their lives are new formed by the Spirit of God working within And I'm convinced it's very important in our intentional evangelism, and this is a series about intentional evangelism, I'm, I'm convinced it's very important for us to be able to explain the phenomenon of Christian compassion. To explain the phenomenon of Christian compassion. If, if we're living our lives being formed by Christ, right, compassion is going to be built in us. That's a matter of discipleship. As you walk with God, you know, you rub up against Jesus, and rubbing up against Jesus, and lots of him rubs off. Not as much as we'd like. But some rubs off, and compassion rubs off with it. Now, before your guilt trip takes off and flies, let me say this. One of, the, one, of the most, one of the most difficult things, I think, about being a Christian, and perhaps, you know, uh, we feel poor, don't we? There's a recession on. Um, it, it restricts, it places some sort of restrictions on your ability to be generous. Do you find that sometimes? That's a hard thing to take. Uh, we're relatively poor. We think of ourselves as poor. Relatively poor, we'll go home, we'll eat something at some point today. Many people in this world won't eat anything today. We go home from church, we've got somewhere to go home from church. Many people won't have anywhere to go today. They don't have a place to live. They don't have anywhere to go. And here's Peter, once a successful Galilean entrepreneur and businessman, because his business was profitable. He's in this same sort of situation in our passage today, as he encounters this guy by the beautiful gate of the temple. It's called beautiful because it was all sort of coppered and bronzed, and, you know, they, when they'd been rebuilding Solomon's temple, they'd sort of gilded the lily in it. Uh, and this used to glint in the sun, and it was you know, where most people came in, so he, he was there. And there were plenty of people going past him. And he, he was there, and Peter goes past him on this day. Once successful, once earning, supporting his family, once able to be generous according to his means. But here we find him, in this passage of scripture today, with a heart full of compassion and love, driven by his fellowship with Christ. But instead of earning and supporting, Peter and John too, both of them, are now living on support. They're living on the gifts of others. To fulfil their ministry. We, we know that living depending on Christian people supporting you in that sort of ad hoc way, that can be quite precarious at times. And here's this guy, and he wants to do something to help this guy. He's in front of him, you know? Do you know that feeling? And you can't think, you can't find what to do. We, we don't know what about John, but Peter certainly had a wife, you know, as well, to think of. And here's this crippled guy, lying by the beautiful gate of the temple, lying there to remind... Jewish worshippers pouring through that gate to the daily service, the afternoon service at three o'clock, of their obligation under Judaism to give alms. And he's lying there trying to make some sort of living in that way, in spite of his disability. And Peter's heart, Peter's new made heart, Peter's heart that has just come through the day of Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out like they've never known before, comes through that gate. His heart has moved. So what do you do about that? And what has it got to do with the series on intentional evangelism? This man's heart is swollen with compassion 
by the sight and by the pleas of the crippled man sitting on the floor, dependent for every material need on lowering himself to the extent that he has, humiliated by the process of begging day after day after day. Peter has compassion. And look, the compassion comes first. The compassion comes out of walking with Jesus. The compassion comes out of our hearts have been changed by the Spirit of God as we walk with our God. The love of God has touched us. The compassion comes first and comes alone. There are no strings on it. Peter doesn't have the means, the means he once had, to alleviate this man's need. Now some of us, we found ourselves in situations like this, we know what it's like, and we feel sometimes condemned because of what we want to do but can't do. So what does a Christian do? At the simplest of levels, Peter doesn't get beaten up about what he can't do, but he certainly does what he can do. And what's that? The beggar gets healed and the good news gets explained. Yes, boom, boom. Yeah, as we were saying earlier on. Okay, so there you go. The beggar gets healed, and the good news gets explained. Both things, no strings, both happen. It's not that I am going to show compassion because then I'll have the opportunity to explain the gospel, and this person will feel motivated to become a Christian just because I've been nice to him. They don't. People are not grateful. Where are you to get that idea from? That's crazy. That doesn't work. There's a logical fallacy at the heart of that one. This man is moved by compassion. See that photo of Matt Jones? Still mm -hmm. the tennis player. <laughs> the day after he won his um, latest Grand Slam, he's outside some sort of eating establishment, and he encounters a big issue seller. And he gives him a bar. Because he's able to. Sometimes we're not. But that initial act of kindness, verses 1 to 10, is just an expression of what Christ has done for Peter. Silver and gold I do not have, verse 6, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. The guy thought he needed money. We don't always assess our own uh, needs the way we should. The, the guy's lying there, I need money. You, you, at one level, mate, you do. But look, I haven't got any. So we're going to do for you what we can do, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Is this guy now able to work and make his living? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Peter, his eyes enlightened by gospel priorities, has addressed the man's fundamental need pretty well. The crippled man's priority was money. Peter's priority could easily have been money. And of course, money is something virtually nothing's done without. But the whole situation, instead of saying, staying crippled either physically or crippled by guilt on Peter's part, gets turned to the glory of God, and to the business of compassion-driven, intentional evangelism. Don't be afraid to offer somebody something that you do have when they're asking for something that you don't. Don't be afraid to be shy. Don't be shy of praying for somebody if you feel God's leading you to do that. Don't be wise, be intelligent. Money is compassion if you've got it. If you haven't, give what you've got and enjoy it. And Peter and John have got Jesus and they enjoyed it. And so did the guy they gave Jesus to. Because he seemed to celebrate pretty smartly uh, when, when that had gone ahead. Jesus' priorities are the ones that get served. Now we kind of feel, don't we, that we've got to serve the people who are in here in front of us. But actually, our overriding concern is not to do that. Our overriding concern is to serve Jesus. And out of that, a lot of other things are going to come. Like serving a lot of other people. That's going to flow. But the priority there is to serve Jesus. Living the gospel. See, we get all these priorities on, you know, on certain sorts of websites where, you know, my priorities are God first, and then finances, and then relationships, and education, jobs, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Living the gospel, number one priority. How does Jesus assess the situation? What is his priority here? I'm serving Jesus' priorities. Yeah, very good. But that's no excuse for not getting stuck in yourself. Because, do you notice what Peter then does? Look at verse 7. He gets physically involved. Just imagine this with your mind's eye a minute for me, will you? Can't you see the situation? This poor beggar at the gate. 
This guy is no stranger to rejection, discourtesy and abuse. Beggars are not. Beggars are not strangers to rejection, discourtesy and abuse. Do you think this man hasn't been taunted before? And along comes this unorthodox, religious type, Peter. He's been at the centre of a bit of a buzz in recent days in Jerusalem. And he walks along and the guy says, give me money, I need money. And Jesus says, I haven't got any money. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. To a guy who's had the sort of life this beggar must have had, this sounds like just another cruel taunt from the Daily Mail, doesn't it? Get up and walk. Let them eat cake. Slackers, go out and get a job. Oh, yeah, they, they hang on trees. Yeah, yeah. To a guy who's had the sort of life he's had, that must have sounded like another cruel taunt. Do you know, to many of the suffering people we encounter, I really do suspect, the hope we hold out to them in the Gospel sounds like a bit of a taunt. Life can't be as good as that. No, no, says Peter, I'm serious, I'm serious. And he grabs the guy by the hand and he drags him to his feet. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. I, you know, I'm sure that guy wasn't the most appealing prospect to get hold of. Caleb and I had an experience last night, didn't we, Caleb? Where Caleb's bottle of you from a couple of years ago started to prolapse. And of course, it's a hands-on experience putting that right, isn't it, Caleb? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't smell too good, doesn't look too good, don't feel too good. It's pretty rubbish, really. But it's a hands-on job that needs to be done. And there's no point wishing it better. There's only one way to get it better. Sometimes you just got to get in there and do the job. <laughs> Tesco's old lemon soap is marvellous. That's an endorsement <laughs> for you. It's great stuff. Great, uh, you know, amazing. Um, him by the hand, pulled him up. I'm sure that guy didn't smell too good. I'm sure he didn't look too good. I'm sure he wasn't an appealing prospect for getting old of. That's the point I'm trying to make. Lots of things in his life are not an appealing prospect for getting old of. But unless you do, this ain't going to improve. And all of a sudden, the guy's perception of what Peter has been saying has shifted from this guy's taunting me. I can stand that. Do you know this bit later on in the story? It says, Peter went off into the temple courts and stuff, and this guy was still holding on to Peter. Can you imagine that? Uh, do you remember when you were a kid and your dad picked you up and put, put, put you on his shoulders? And all of a sudden, whoa, 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 it was wobbly because the world was a different place and now you were at a different level altogether. This guy's still hanging on to Peter. It's high up here, isn't it? You know? I'm on legs now. This is high. Well, that's what he's dealing with. There's a point where we can do what we can do. We can do and we must do what we can do. And Peter does it and he gets hold of him and he picks him up. Prepared to get fully physically involved with the situation and now a gospel opportunity has been established, verses 9 and 10. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple get called beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So now the man's fit, nearly so, but only in body. He's only fit in body. The job's not done. Nothing like a local trophy of grace, though. There's nothing like God doing something, is there, to, to get a situation to open up. That seems exactly like what's happened here. Do you know what? The NIV argues is absolute rubbish here. Because the Greek says, walking and leaping and praising God. But that's not very middle class, is it? <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's why that trans translational choice was made, but for goodness sake, the guy is now walking and leaping and praising God. Goodness, what's going on here? Can't things like that going on. Outrageous. Outrageous. <laughs> this is the temple. Shh. <laughs> oh, the man they all know is now carrying things forward, and his eccentric liturgy of worship, shall we say, is not orthodox, is not usual, but it is definitely authentic. He is overjoyed at the goodness of God. And that, you know, is magnetic. Because what happens is that Peter goes on out of the place where they do the, 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 the service, you know, the three o'clock service has happened now. They've, got, they've gone on in, they've done the service, and they've come on out. And this guy is giving it some, you know, because he's got legs, and they work. Phenomenal! 
crow follows them back out from the worship in the sanctum type place area in the, in the inner courts and follows them back out through the temple gate to Solomon's colonnade. The crowd has come. I mean, Peter does not have to announce the date and the time of the meeting, right? The guys leaping about the place, they all know, they all see, and they come because they can see God has been at work. We need to be able to allow people to see that God has been at work. Not necessarily by leaping, jumping, and shouting, okay? But in our seeking to tell people about Jesus, they need to know something authentic about the fact that he is alive and well and doing things. This is a good idea. It's something very important. Here's a question. There is. Little babies that take one or two steps yeah. and they fall over. God had given him everything he needed in one. It's a great principle, isn't it? Yeah. The storm on the lake. Another case where God just suspends yeah. the entire yeah. physical process. Um, yeah. Forget the wonder, because it's not just a little bit of process. Okay. It is... Completely Everything you needed. Completely done. Yeah. Completely, completely done. Yeah. Wow. Authenticity. Authenticity is the issue. So Peter's now well set for what comes next. They come out of that temple area, they come to Solomon's colony, the place further out where everybody could come, because you know, you could only go sort of to the next step if you were sort of qualified in a certain way. You could, go there if you were Jewish, you could go there if you were a man, you could go there if you were a priest and so on. So they all come back out again to the outer courts of the temple where everybody can come. And there's Solomon's colonnade. Solomon's colonnade. There it is. Lovely big shaded area, lots of thermal mass to soak up the heat of the day, and these pillars which disturb the floor of air, which makes it cooler inside. Do you know about that? Greek buildings have pillars architecture lesson, okay. Um, so it's a nice cool place where everybody can come and sit after the sort of service and what used to happen was that the, the, the teachers of the law who were trying to make a name for themselves and who were big already would be there sitting at the Solomon's Holiday and people would gather around. It was a cool, nice, warm, you know, in the, in the hot environment at the time. It was a nice cool place to come and hear God's word expanded and of course they're all sitting there that day waiting for their followers to come up and in comes Peter with this guy jumping and leaping about the place and where's the congregation? It is over there. And this fisherman from Galilee has got the, got the crowd. And Peter starts talking by addressing what is uppermost here in all of their minds. He starts with their astonishment. Well, look, I mean, you know, he's not following this guy. You can see something's happened. He starts with their astonishment at what they see this crowd. You don't need to start by announcing a text. You need to start with what people have got. They're astonished by something like Jesus and his followers are. What's going on? You start by addressing the people you've got and their context. And, and, and okay, we don't need to go into it. But Peter goes on to say what God has done. <coughs> he sent Jesus and he's died on a cross, blah, blah, blah. And he doesn't back off from saying what you did wrong. You nailed him to a cross. You, with the help of wicked men, nailed him to a cross. But what God did next was he raised him from the dead. He's laying out the doctrinal stuff that we know that I don't need to go over with you. And here's how you know it's true. Firstly, we are witnesses and we're telling you. This is the level we usually come in at, isn't it? This is how you know it's true. God has done this and this and this and this. In my experience, in my life, I've seen these things. And Peter has got the extra advantage, the luxury, of being able to point to the guy who's still looking about the place now, right? Say, that is what God has done. You've seen Jesus at work and alive in that guy. The Jesus you killed six, seven weeks ago? On the hill over there? And he poured out his spirit, sort of yesterday, <laughs> at the feast. Okay, so you've got this act of kindness flowing out of Christian compassion, an act of discipleship. Then you've got an explanation <coughs> from Peter, and then you've got an application in verses 17 to 21. What this means for you, says Peter, is you've got to turn around. You need to repent. How do you feel about telling people they've got to repent? Now then, what you mean, you're sophisticated student people, you need to repent. It doesn't, it sticks in your throat a little, doesn't it? You've been up to X, Y, Z, says Peter, and now what you've got to do is you've got to repent of it. And you've got to say that. 
He hasn't got to use the word repent necessarily, because it's a slightly old fashioned word, but he has got to get the message across that you've been living your life in a certain way, and you've got to change your attitude, you've got to change your approach, and change your direction and come back here. Now, he's got to say that because this is the fundamental gospel word from Jesus. It's the word that came with the herald of the Messiah, with John the Baptist, preaching a baptism of repentance for their forgiveness of sins out in the desert. People flocked. And it's the message, the word that comes first from Jesus. Mark 1.15, Jesus starts preaching. What does he say? The time has come. Your time's up, boys. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. There's the application of the gospel. Repent and believe the good news. These guys he's talking to in Jerusalem, they hadn't listened to that. They weren't part of the crowd that had followed Jesus around Galilee. This is the religious lot of in Jerusalem. But now they've followed Peter, John, and the guy who was leaping and dancing, back out of the inner courts, back through the beautiful gate, into Solomon's colonnade, where Peter had now got a ready-made crowd to preach to, in the very heart of the Jewish system that's just crucified Jesus. <laughs> How about that? that? That's a full toss on the leg stump again, isn't it? Fancy that. And his big point is they really need to change their attitude to Jesus. Who has fulfilled the law and the prophets. He's still alive and living in his church. And they need to turn around and get back in line. Because they've been way out. Way out of line. We have not conveyed the gospel to anybody. Until in some shape or form. They've seen why. And heard that from us. Here's where the gospel applies. Until that point, we really are about the business of influencing fish, not catching them. Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, not ticklers of fish. Repent. You need to come back. Repent and turn to God. Repent is the turning around. Turning to God is becoming a disciple and a follower of Jesus. Follow the Son. Ah, you're laughing at my bit of stuff on the wall here. See, I'll let's keep you awake and there's a bit of stuff on the wall. Turn your face towards the sun and the shadows fall behind you. How about that? That's the way it works, isn't it? Now that's a very, very odd thing to say to that particular crowd of people. Why? Where were they? Caleb, where were they? Temple. Thank you, Caleb. Spot on answer. Pardon? Beautiful gates. No, the Solomon's Colonnade. Yes, where they came to hear the law. Good. What did they come there for? Just answer the question. They'd come there to worship God in the service at 3 o'clock, and then they drifted out to Solomon's colony to hear the law expanded to them. And Peter said, you've got to repent and turn to God. Well, what do you think we're here for? What do you think we come here for? Yeah, but says Peter, good intentions just aren't always going to be enough. If you ever needed evidence that turning up for church isn't good enough, here it is. Because these people have made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, which is one of the major feasts of the, of, of the Jewish calendar of the year. And they've come to the temple to meet with God at the afternoon sacrifice service. And then they've drifted back out to the court of Israel at the Solomon's Colonnade, which is where you went to hear the best teachers of the law that the land could offer. And Peter says, the lesson of what you've seen is you put yourselves in the wrong with God by rejecting Jesus. But God has overcome your rebellion by raising Jesus, who is therefore still at work, doing all the Old Testament said he would do. So now you need to repent of what you've done and turn to God. Coming to church isn't enough. It would be nice. But it's not enough. Peter states the case, but he doesn't turn enough. Look at verse 17. It's just not in the spirit of so much preaching you might hear. Listen to this, verse 17. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. You just didn't see it. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God. See, it's not, 
Repent, or you will perish. Right, it's not bad. Guys, I know. Guys, I've been there. Guys, I've turned my back on Jesus. But come on now. Now you see and hear. Repent and turn to God. And in that approachable, humble, encouraging spirit, Peter goes on. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. That's brave. That's Peter saying, the prophet foretold in Deuteronomy 18, I think it is, the prophet who was to come is Jesus. For stuff like that, Jesus very recently got killed. Or well, less than that. You must listen to everything he tells you. Get this? Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. <laughs> so with the affirmation of this truth, with the biblical background to it, there's a warning. Come on guys, repent and turn to God, because otherwise, you know, if you don't listen to him, you'll be completely cut off from among your people, your Jewish people, your Jewish heritage and race. <laughs> wow, he's got some bottle, hasn't he? An affirmation from the prophets. What this lame guy has done is to go leaping like a deer. Does that ring any bells? Isaiah 35? It says that when the Messiah comes, you know, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the, the lame will leap like a deer. Here he is, he's leaping around the temple. Watch, there he goes, look. <laughs> this gospel's got the prophets behind it. There he goes, <laughs> This Jesus is that Messiah, and there it is, you can see it jumping across the temple courts. Come on, what's the matter with you? It's, it's, it's sound, it's solid, it's attested, it's there. Look, 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 look. There's your affirmation. That is what was said there. And you can see it with your eyes. Here now in the temple of Israel's God at Jerusalem, it is not just Jesus who's doing this, but his followers also are doing his work still. And there it is, like Isaiah 35. Prophesied by Isaiah way back in the 8th century BC, and that guy that you're so used to is leaping around like a deer in the courts of the temple. This is that, says Peter. The prophets affirm that all this is of God, so repent and turn to God. That's the message of Peter's intentional evangelism that day. Jesus is the Messiah prophesied in your Bible from long ago, and he is still living in his church, in spite of your best efforts to silence him. Don't be afraid to tell this to your friends. And then he says, oh, by the way, it's backed up by Moses. And of course, Moses has got that warning in it about being cut off if you don't listen. Peter is talking to the religious people of his day. We've got plenty. I mean, the chapels of Wales are empty, but there's plenty of people who, who see those as their ancestral worship site and have some sort of emotional or cultural or historical allegiance. And Peter goes to such in this way. He says, look, it's backed up, it's attested, it's the stuff you live in Sunday school. Do, 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 do. And there it goes. It comes with attestation from the prophets and from Moses, and it comes with a warning. But that affirmation is followed by an encouragement. Do we encourage people into faith? Do you do that? We're getting on now, verse 24 to 26, we're getting there, aren't we? We're going to have a conclusion in a minute. Do you ever think of encouraging people in the course of your intentional evangelism? Look at this. All the positive outcomes of repentance have been referred to already back there in verse 19b. Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. That sounds okay. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Why should I become a Christian? Because God's going to make you fresh. Excuse me? He's going to refresh you. I'm sure that guy looking at the temple wasn't very fresh yet. But he's going to be. Times of refreshing will come from the Lord. And he'll send the Christ who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Jesus Christ. Better. And the point now gets explicitly underlined. See, Peter preaches Christ like he is good news and then spells it out that he is. Jesus is good news. 
God said in first to you, rejecting, saviour, killing Jewish people of Jerusalem, in the congregation here in the temple today, he sent it to you to bless you. What? God wants to be nice to me? Who would believe that? And he's going to do it by turning each of you from your wicked ways. We live in a world which confidently affirms that it is wicked to deny people a life of any sort of wickedness they choose. R.H. says, denying people the choice of any sort of wickedness they want is, is naughty. We're naughty people doing that. But says Peter, God is calling you in line with all the Old Testament prophets you already know and believe in to a life of repentance and following Jesus because that is what is going to bless you. Not a life of unrestrained indulgence, willful self-indulgence, but following Jesus is going to really bless you. And whether it's religious or immoral self-indulgence, that isn't great for you. But following this Jesus is. Do we ever spend any time saying that to people? This is good. Pity that. Okay, he said a lot of things, doesn't he? And uh, there's five points in this sermon. I'm going to stop in a minute. But um, look at what we've got here. The main point of this passage in Acts 3 is, is, is that the works of the risen Jesus, which fulfil the Old Testament prophecies about God's messianic saviour, those things are still being done amongst his true followers in his churches for real. And that's a crucial part of the message of our intentional evangelism. The works of the Messiah are being done through his followers. God is still blessing people by calling to repentance and faith in Him. That's a crucial part of the things that we need to intend to say. But this episode in the unfolding of the plan of God gives us a lot of clues about how to say this too. Look at what he does. Peter affirms the right things these people already know. He's taken them to Sunday school. He's taken them to the things they already know. He's taken them to the things they're already persuaded of. And he affirms the right things these people already know. It's good to affirm the right things people already know. And Peter evidences the claims of Christ on these people's lives. And he challenges them to change in the light of what Jesus has really done. And the big thing he's looking for, actually, is for them to change their existing attitude to Jesus and where their feet then take them. Because they've changed their attitude to Jesus. You killed him. God raised him from the dead. Change it around him. Change that attitude to Jesus around. So my suggestion is that after all that, we've got a lot to learn from this passage about eye-opening acts of kindness, about explaining from God's revelation in his word of the confusing things in people's lives. You couldn't work out why that guy was leaving. That's marvellous. About applying the implications of God's truth, about affirming from the fulfilment of prophecy, especially to the religious, the implications of the truth about Jesus, about encouraging people of the good intentions of God towards them, amongst his people. And if that sounds like a lot to take on board today, yes, we need to ask ourselves why. Because this is fundamental. Founding of the churches, the community of the people of God, fundamental, the beginning days of Christian discipleship at the birth of the church stuff. Why have we lost it? 